Hello everybody and welcome to this paper walkthrough of PointNet deep learning on point sets for 3D classification and segmentation. So um, if you have done any work on 3D deep learning, then you probably already heard this paper. Uh, this is probably one of the most influential papers uh, on that space, since it was um, the first one to propose a method which um, um, uses um, and creates a network which processes directly uh, 3D points without having an intermediate representation. So what I mean with that is that before, if we had um, any shape, which uh, we scan, for example, if you have any object that we scan with a, a laser scanner or some other form of scanner, which basically returns 3D points. So for example, if we have a set of 3D points, um, each with uh, X, Y, and Z coordinates, what we did before PointNet and what also some other applications still do is to find another um, form of representation which is uh, easy for a network to process. So for example, um, so one thing that uh, they used to do is uh, for example to create um, um, 3D meshes or for example to use voxels and um, all this form of representations which uh, uh, basically transform these 3D points, which are basically um, three points which represent the coordinate in space, um, transform them into another representation which is easier for their network to process and then um, either classify such set of points. So for example, it is a mug, this is a table, this is a car, as for example, it's written here or um, perform part segmentation. So which part of the plane um, is that point belonging to and uh, so on and so forth. And um, the revolutionary thing that PointNet did was that it uh, basically said, no, we do not want to use such intermediate uh, representation because they are inefficient. Uh, in a way that, um, for example, to create 3D uh, voxels, uh, one uses uh, way more computational power to then process them, because uh, just of the way that uh, 3D voxels are presented, they basically need more information uh, to be stored. And they basically say uh, that uh, we want to find a way to process such points directly. So each point is processed, and the only thing that uh, we give to the network is uh, indeed uh, a, a set of endpoints. So for example, if you have a set of endpoints uh, with uh, 3D coordinates, so here we have endpoints x, y, and z. And this is the only thing that goes to the network. And the network then uh, as shown, uh, for example, here performs other part segmentation, semantic segmentation, or simple classification. So uh, in this paper walkthrough, we're going to cover uh, the key points um, of the paper. And uh, more specifically, we are going to talk about uh, what the challenges were before um, or the, what, what the challenges were in creating PointNet and uh, how the authors uh, found a way to solve such challenges. So let's just jump into the problem statement and uh, see uh, what the challenges and what the goals are for this paper. So the idea is that given a set of 3D points um, uh, from one to N, uh, with each point corresponding uh, x, y, and z coordinates. Um, and however, of course, such, such concepts could be extended to older extra features, such as, for example, in if we use a LiDAR channel, uh, a LiDAR sensor, then we would have the intensity channel for the return points. 
And given the set of points, we want uh, to find two kind of networks. The first one is uh, a classification network. And uh, the classification network takes um, um, a point cloud. So, so just a set of um, points and it outputs K scores for the K candidate classes. Um, so what this means is that um, suppose that we are interested in classifying a shape in, for example, car, uh, table, and bowl. Um, suppose that we have um, a set of points which represent a bowl. The idea is that if we feed these uh, points through the network, then the network is going to output something like this. So the idea is that the network is going to output uh, K scores. So in this case, K equal um, three. So we're going to have uh, uh, one, two, and three. And uh, basically this is going to output a one-hot encoding of um, the scores. So for example, here we'd have uh, um, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, and uh, 0 0.6, which uh, would uh, tell us that the network is, for example, recognizing that this is uh, a bold sensor. Uh, this is the highest uh, score encoding. Um, the other thing that uh, the authors want to achieve is to perform a so-called um, semantic segmentation. The semantic segmentation, we are um, interested um, in basically um, telling for each point of the shape to which part of the object it belongs. So, for example, if we have a, a chair like this, then our goal is that given the uh, points that we are trying to sample, so given that uh, this chair contains such points, um, which uh, of course belong to different parts of the chair. So, for example, here I'm sampling a couple of points belonging to the um, for, ex for, for example, to the legs. So for example, we could indicate that the legs are yellow. So such points would be there. And uh, for example, to the part where we see it, or for, for example, the backrest, like this. And uh, this could be, for example, uh, the label that uh, our data set gives us. So for each of the endpoints, we have uh, um, that we also have uh, to which parts. So for example, we would have one, two, and three. So if we have endpoints, then we would have that, for example, this one, one, this two, this two, this three, this one. So for each of the points, we have uh, the class which it belongs to. And uh, uh, the goal of our network is uh, to uh, the output is then to have, um, similar to before, uh, we'll have that for each of the endpoints that we input to the network, we'll have, again, a sort of one-hot encoding of uh, the points which, are, which we are trying to um, predict, uh, of, of which semantic part um, they are basically. So uh, here uh, in this case, we would have uh, only 0, 1, and 2, uh, or I start from 1, so 1, 2, and 3, um, representing this, um, representing the three parts that we had here. Uh, so again, here we would have, for example, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.7, uh, ideally, if uh, we are. Um, trying to find, for example, part of the leg. So this is what our network should uh, uh, at the end output. It's a, um, a network for um, directly classifying the whole set of points. And the other one is to basically um, find uh, a semantic uh, uh, labeling for each of the uh, points that we feed it to.
So now that we know what the goal of the paper is, we can um, go and read a little bit uh, to the paper and see uh, what are the challenges of uh, um, creating such network and uh, how the authors solved it. So <clears throat> um, the authors uh, start um, the um, idea of uh, creating a, a network which can perform deep learning on point sets with the properties of point sets in Rn. And uh, the three properties that they uh, say that are important is that uh, a set of point is unordered, there is a sort of interaction among those points, and uh, such sets are invariant under transformations. So let's see what this means. Um, suppose we have this shape here, which represents a chair. And suppose that we have a scanner, which takes some of, uh, which, which basically returns some points in the 3D space, which represent the entirety of the chair. So the whole thing. So here we'll have end points. Now, uh, in order to uh, perform any meaningful operation on such points, we would have to store such points. And in order to store such points, at least digitally, uh, one has to uh, basically give an order to these points. So for example, we could have that this is point one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And so in our vector, we could have one, two, three, four, five, six, until n. So this is our vector, which uh, represents uh, our set of points of the chair. Now, the thing is that uh, such order is only meaningful for us. However, in the reality, when we look at this uh, set of 2D points, um, this does not uh, really make um, um, much or, or it doesn't really have much importance in the way that we stored it because the position 3D space is independent of how we stored it. So ideally we could have for example another set of order which we could have for example 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 again until n. And what the author argue is that um, the network which does not uh, yet know what uh, a set of 3D points in space means, uh, should uh, learn that uh, independently of how we feed such points in networks, so on the order that we store these points, um, the results would be the same. So uh, given this set of points and this set of points here, the output should be that this set of points is a chair. So the, thing, the second thing that the author argued that is important for uh, point sets in Rn is that the points actually um, interact with each other in local neighbors. What this means is that although, for example, our scanner returns um, again a set of points representing the shape that we want, we have that the different points uh, represent something different about the objects. And what I mean about this is that, for example, the points which represent the legs of the chair together, uh, their, basically their neighborhood of points, their interaction, in, in the meaning that they are nearby each other, represent such leg of the chair. So the relation that, for example, these two points have together is not the same as these two points have with each other because these two points here are actually representing a minimum, meaningful semantic part uh, regarding the shape. And so such uh, meaningful uh, semantic representation or, or not, not semantic representation, but these uh, features that they encode just by being nearby each other should be taken into account by the network. So the third thing that they argue is that point sets should be invariant to transformations. And what this means is that, suppose that here um, we have an object like that. If our network sees the object like this, should tell 
that this is a chair. However, same thing should happen if we, for example, rotate the chair in any of the direction or we flip it and uh, we perform a uh, rigid transformation, for example, to the um, input point set, um, the thing should uh, uh, be independent of basically uh, the transformation that we apply and the output uh, of both the classification and the part segmentation should be the same. So let's just now see uh, the overview of um, the point net network and uh, what um, the author actually proposed to solve such problems. And then we will go a little bit more in detail uh, regarding the different um, parts um, that uh, they actually play a role, all, all the different things that they implemented, which are actually aimed to solve uh, these uh, three problems here. So um, just from um, a really uh, basic uh, explanation, we have um, here in this diagram, actually we have three networks. Uh, the first one is uh, the classification network, and this is the one that given a set of points should just tell us, uh, yes, this is a chair, this is a table. Uh, then we have uh, um, a segmentation network, and this is the network which basically labels each of the points uh, uh, to the semantic uh, label which they have. So for example, the legs, um, the backrest, or uh, where we sit in the, in, for example, if we input a chair. Um, finally, we have uh, this uh, small network here, which is uh, called in the paper TNet. And uh, this um, has uh, the role of basically finding a transformation um, it basically has the role of finding a matrix, which is then multiplied um, by, um, which, which points are multiplied by, and basically the idea is that with this um, matrix uh, here, we solve the problems of invariance and the transformation because uh, such uh, matrix transformation that we find using this TNet should basically realign uh, or a set of points with a canonical space. However, uh, we'll talk a little bit more um, when we analyze the TNet. Um, so let's just see uh, how these things work. Uh, so the input, as we said, is an uh, endpoint with x, y, and z features. So again, we'll have endpoints. Uh, Uh, with x, y, and z, so x, y, and z. So basically, um, if you think about, for example, a Python implementation, this is going to be um, a tensor with uh, dimensionality n by three, uh, where n is uh, each different point, and x, y, and z are the points in space, uh, the, the position space of that point. Then <clears throat> we have this um, uh, input transform, and as we said, basically this TNet here returns a three by three transformation. So what we have here is that we'll have for this case a three by three transformation, which basically just we use to multiply or n by three input tensor. So we use to, uh, we, we can just multiply this and this is uh, just basically, it does not, um, change any of the features of our, um, of our points. So the X, Y, and Z uh, are not transformed into something else, but they are just, for example, uh, rotated along the Z axis or something like that. Uh, so just uh, a shape remains the same. And uh, if we go and plot the points, which uh, are returned in this position here, they're still meaningful to, uh, or for example, vision system. Uh, then the the core component uh, for extraction features from the points is the multilayer perceptor. And what this does is that it uh, takes each of these uh, points here. So for example, suppose that we have a point here, a point here with X, Y, and Z. And what this does is that it transforms this uh, X, Y, and Z. So these three features into 
another feature vector. And this feature vector in this case has uh, 64 dimensionality. So it's something like that. So 0, 1, 2, until we arrive at 63. And this in the code is achieved by um, 1D convolution, where basically um, uh, such filters are multiplied by the x, y, and z until um, we uh, reach a 64 dimensionality uh, as uh, an output of the filter. And uh, basically, uh, at, the at the end of uh, the first multilayer perceptron, here uh, we'd have again endpoints. However, now the dimensionality of their feature vector is 64. We repeat this thing again here. So we take this 64 and we again transform it into another 64. So the dimensionality here does not change. However, the features change. So the, the convolutional filters would have uh, uh, different parameters, which will be learned by the network. Um, here we have uh, <clears throat> a similar network to the first one. However, here we have that um, uh, given this um, um, dimensionality here, which is 64, we again want to um, transform it into a canonical space. And uh, uh, the canonical space here um, in 64, of course, if uh, we, we cannot plot it because we live in a 3D world. However, even a 64 dimensionality um, of such points, we want to align it to uh, a canonical space that the network will decide it for itself, which, which is actually, uh, there are learnable parameters. So it will learn to basically find the optimal um, transformation to transform each of the points into this canonical space. Uh, again, here we have the same idea. So this, um, uh, again, here, if, if we go and, and check the output of this, uh, um, of, of the features here at the end of this block, um, there will be the same features that we had here, just, uh, for example, rotated or things like that. Um, here, Again, we have this multilayer perceptron. Again, we transform into 64, then we go to 128 and 1024. So basically here. So here we have, again, another block of feature transformation. So uh, we go to 64, 128, and at the end here we'll have that such features have dimensionality 1024. Then, here we reach um, probably the crucial point in the paper, which is the use of uh, a symmetric function um, to solve the problem of um, um, dealing with unordered points. And such symmetric function, uh, the use is uh, the max pool operation. And uh, for example, let's, let, let's take an example and, and see what, uh, uh, we mean with solving the problem with another points. So here we have that each point has 1024 features. So if we want to compare it to the uh, beginning uh, where each point had uh, X, Y, and Z, here each point has uh, 1024 features, which would mean something that uh, um, the network knows what it means. Uh, however, um, since we want to deal with uh, um, set of points which the order does not matter. We uh, need to teach the network to basically extract information about the shape that we are feeding it uh, independently of the order. And the max pool actually allows us to do um, exactly this thing because suppose that we have um, three examples. Suppose that this is um, returns one, this is has three, and this is four, five. Is seven, three, four, ten, eleven, and one. Here, the max pool operation here will take for each of the features, will go across, for example, feature zero across all the points and will take the maximum. So the maximum here would be ten, the maximum here would be eleven, the maximum here would be five. 
And as we can see, even if we had that all points here at the beginning were shuffled. So for example, we had that uh, point number one and two were changed in position or um, every other points was changed. If the features, if, if, if the um, um, values of um, the multilayer perception and uh, the TNET and everything was the same, then we would have basically um, another um, set of features which would be exactly like this one however with uh, inverted uh, features so for example the 7 would be um, here above and the 10 would be then here however if we take the maximum independently of the position that we have the result would be the same so even if the 10 was uh, in the first position then we'd always have 10 here because that was uh, that, that is the maximum uh, value for that sort of feature. And this is actually uh, probably the key feature that uh, also the author express as such of the network. Because by having such max pool, then the result, uh, this 1024 features, would be something that um, should ideally represent, as they write here, global features of the shape. So there are the features which basically um, represent the um, meaningful information, uh, the essential information to, for example, classify such shape as a determined shape. And uh, um, yeah, this is a, a pretty cool thing that they thought of. Um, then what uh, they do is that they use again a multi-layer perceptron. If I'm not wrong, they use a fully connected layer. So they had uh, 1024 features here and they use uh, uh, basically a fully connected layer. So here we go from 0, 1, 2 until we go 1024. And uh, here we have um, Again, that here we'll have a layer of fully connected, another layer, and then we'll have a layer K, so that is 12, 256. And basically, this is, uh, those are all connected together. And uh, this final layer here is, is, uh, is actually the layer which uh, learns uh, to basically classify this 100, uh, 1024 features in one of the K categories. So um, again, here, uh, as we talked at the beginning, this uh, uh, K categories is basically at the end, is, is going to be a, a, a one hot encoding uh, vector um, with 0, 1 until we reach K. And uh, um, yeah, basically, um, dependent on, on the label that we have, uh, the network should uh, try to have the maximum value in the position of um, the label. So for example, if we have that the chair, uh, that, that we are inputting a chair and the label is for example three, then the value here zero, one, two, and three should be the maximum one. Um, then uh, what we have is that um, the segmentation network is uh, basically just an extension of uh, the network that we just described, um, which however um, takes the global features which are extracted by uh, the first part of the classification network and uh, um, combines them together with features of each point. So again, if we go over here, um, here we had that uh, our network um, has undergone a couple of tra features transformation. So now here in this point, uh, we are, we're basically in a similar um, position on this one. So we have endpoints and each of these points has 64 features. What they do now is that they concatenate each of these uh, um, 64 features with uh, the 1024 features. So here we'll have uh, endpoints, so n. However, here we'll go until 64, right? Um, which are taken exactly from here. However, then we also concatenate uh, for each point these uh, uh, global features. 
uh, here this 1024 features and this is basically a repetition it's it's, it's the same uh, 1024 numbers which are basically concatenated with uh, uh, each of the uh, in each of the endpoints and the idea here is that we go and uh, we solve the problem of uh, this interaction among points so the idea that we have here is that if we take this um, um, these uh, features here uh, which is this n by 64 basically for each of these endpoints the 64 features represent information which uh, um, are connected to the um, point itself so so there are features which uh, uh, represent the point uh, itself uh, in another dimensionality however they are the single points um transformed and by concatenating the features which would represent for example the global information about the structure then we can create um, a combo of uh, local and global features which uh, we can then process in a similar fashion as we did above so again with the perceptron which transform uh, for example this 1088 to um, 512 and so on until we arrive uh, here where, where we have uh, 1028 features which are, uh, are transformed into M. And M, as we saw here above, is basically um, the number of uh, semantic part which uh, the network can predict. So for example, if we have um, chairs, cars, and bowls, we'll have, for example, that M is equal to 10, and uh, M0 is, for example, uh, the wheel of a car, M1 is the windshield, and so on, and M7 is going to be the leg of the uh, chair, and uh, yeah, all, all of the possible semantic parts that the network can predict. And uh, yeah, this is uh, a, a pretty cool idea, in my opinion, uh, the, the combination of local and global features uh, to, at the end, uh, yeah, combine them together to uh, achieve the best performance. Okay, um, what else can we say? Um, the network, uh, it's, um, uh, the paper is pretty well written. There is a, a um, mathematic uh, interpretation of all these um, different things that we talked about. And um, yeah, they also offer a theoretical analysis since uh, this is uh, quite a simple, uh, case and uh, they also compared themselves with uh, what at the time was uh, the state of the art and um, yeah, they give some examples. I really hope you found um, this paper quote through interesting and um, hopefully I didn't miss any major details. I also want to say that uh, I've linked in the description my implementation on GitHub of uh, the network and uh, um, all the needed script to train um, the classification, the segmentation network. Um, so you can check it out. Uh, goodbye and until the next paper.